Now, the third person to refuse the medal <laughs> is one of my particular heroes, William Richard Letterby. This is a relief of him as master of the Art Workers Guild. Um, and although he's not much talked about nowadays, his influence on the whole world of design, not just in this country, but on the whole, in the whole world, has been extremely profound. He had been one of Shaw's original professional team. He served his articles of the Shaw, where he became the most trusted collaborator, and he had taken off brilliantly on his own by doing Avon Tyrrell, which was designed as a calendar house. It has 365 windows, 52 doors, and 12 chimneys. <laughs> and it's very strange that this very austere socialist designed this house for the, the raffish and very patrician Lord Manners, who built a house out of his winnings at Aintree after he notoriously trained a horse and rode it for a wager to win the Grand National in 1882. The commission seems to have been passed to Letherby as a parting gift when he left Shaw's office. And it was at the time of the building of Avon Tyrrell that Letherby also joined the Society for, for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, Antiscrape, founded by William Morris, who invented that title for it, and became close, even intimate with Morris, whose incendiary politics he shared, and with his lifelong architect collaborator, Philip Webb, whose hero worshipping biography he would write later on. There were several more houses and some church work over the decade, at the end of which, in 1898, he was commissioned to design an innovative office building for the Eagle Insurance Company in Cornwall Row in Birmingham. It looks rather gray and anonymous, and of course, it now has lettering which belongs not to Letherby's world at all. But it was um, a carefully proportioned and very carefully designed facade based on a double square with square intervals and a lot of double squares recurring. This was actually noted some years ago by Professor Vaughan Hart, but it's never been really examined. And in fact, I think uh, Lethaby's use of proportion become, is, is rather peculiar. It's articulated, the whole facade is articulated into three parts. The ground floor with, many, with a many windowed main body above that, and the top heavy crown. Uh, sharply separated and ruled by an, another proportion for the top floor uh, at 50 degrees. So it's, it's a strange kind of proportional pro progression. Um, and as I say, uh, Letherby was very cagey about the way he designed. And this is another strange example of his using uh, brick and stone in, in combination and uh, the very careful proportioning, which makes him actually more like some of his Viennese contemporaries than anybody in this country. But the Eagle Insurance points also to something that fascinated him throughout his life, and that is a question of architecture and myth. He summed up his conviction in an aphorism. Architecture is building which is made to carry a story and convey a message. And what carries messages above all for him was symbolic reference. The most of his contemporary architects, such arcane, arcane concerns, may have seemed fringe stuff, yet that stuff was very much in the air at the time he was working. A few years earlier, a group of French painters and poets even adopted symbolism as their label. Symbolism was cultivated in occult circles, while Madame Blavatsky, the founding mother of Theosophy, and after her death, Annie Besant, collected a powerful following in Britain. Lady Latins was one of them. 
The poet William Butler Yeats moved from a general theosophical loyalty to join the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in 1887. This is all about the time that Letherby was writing, was working on this book. And Yeats wrote, have not all races had their first unity from a mythology that marries them to rock and hill? That marriage to rock and hill fascinated the otherwise skeptical Letherby, who considered buildings as representations of an idealized world fabric. In his first book, which I show you on the screen, Architecture, Mrs. and Myth, he quotes an account of Vedic architectural symbolism. A building had three stories, the earth, the air, and the sky. This book was a brilliant, original, synthetic essay, which he characteristically de denigrated later, and when he issued a revised version as a series of articles in, in building news, oddly enough, um, full of with a, an enormously elaborate bibliography, full of works which were published between the two books, in fact. It wasn't very well reviewed at the time. The only person who really took it up with enthusiasm was Charles Rennie Mackintosh, who gave a lecture in Glasgow largely pirated from this book. But um, it only ever had one edition, and as I say, uh, It, the, the conceptual model, concentrated in a cosmogram involving a hemispherical vault over a square Earth, was the basis, basic notion of this, and it is stated, as it were, adumbrated in that diagram on the cover. So he talked about ceilings like the sky and pavements like meadows or like the sea. He talked about, but not himself devise, images animated by this vision of the buildings of the past. Now, we are at the break of the century, um, and his last major project was a collaborative and quite original competitive scheme for, the concrete, for a concrete vaulted cathedral of Liverpool. This is a perspective imposed on a photograph. Uh, I think it would have been perhaps rather more friendly than Scott's Gothic pile. At any rate, uh, that is the west elevation. It was a strange project. As I say, it was collaborative, and it was a very uh, adventurous exercise in the use of concrete. Although Norman Shaw, his friend and previous patron, was on the jury, the project wasn't even placed. So it was a definite setback. At the same time, he suffered a further setback on his last executed project. The Church of All Saints, Brockhampton, in Hampshire. Uh, I don't know whether it's clear from the photograph, but you see that the roof is in fact a thatched roof. So it's a brick building with a thatched roof. This is the interior, and I think, I'm not sure whether you can see them, but on either side of the altars are angels by Burne Jones, executed by William Morris's workshop. Uh, now, this roof is, in fact, concrete. So you have a rather curious combination. You have a concrete structure roofed in thatch. Um, there were troubles. There was settlement, the building, although it's, it's fine now, uh, there were certainly subtle troubles, and Leatherby thought himself responsible for them. So. It was at this time that he actually saw the break happening. Letterby was very much aware of what was happening, both in this country and elsewhere. And he loved thatch, and he feared concrete. 
and yet he knew that the future was with concrete and with steel. Liverpool and Brockhampton were two frustrations which coincided with his withdrawal from active practice. He was becoming convinced that the building of the future was with the new materials and that if he was to concern himself with building in the future, he would have to study the mechanics of reinforced concrete as well as of steel. And he wasn't, just wasn't capable of doing that, he thought. So he moved his energies almost wholly to, uh, to teaching and to writing. He had become involved in setting up a scheme for technical education for the newly constituted LCC and uh, uh, through that became in fact the director of the Central School of Arts and Crafts in Southampton Row, which still stands, and his visionary installation management of it and the way the teaching was organized became extremely important. The primary interest of, of the teaching, as far as he was concerned, was to have classes taught both by artist designers and by craftsmen. He wanted to break down the pernicious division between arty design and crafty production as he wrote at the time. Workmanship when separated by too wide a gulf from fresh thought, that is from design, inevitably decays. And on the other hand, ornamentation divorced from workmanship is necessarily unreal and quickly falls into affectation. So the system he developed at the Central School was very much involved in that bringing together of the designer and the craftsman and bringing together the two, two worlds and making them fertilize each other. The system was very much admired by the then German cultural attaché at the embassy, Hermann Mutesius, whose work in this country culminated in a vast three volume history of the English house which let it be reviewed when it first appeared, and in which several of his projects were published, notably Avon Tyrrell, which I talked about before. And through Mutesius, Lethaby's teaching methods became well known in Germany, and they would form the basis of the teaching system at the Weimar Bauhaus. So you see the way in which uh, the preliminary teaching went to uh, design teaching went to material with the idea of the building as the central element in the, 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 the kern of the teaching was very much what Lethaby taught at the central school. He moved, he was sometimes quite peremptory and moved students around. Edward Johnson came to uh, learn I think, uh, weaving, was moved into lettering and became the most prominent calligrapher of his time. This is a text which he uh, wrote out uh, just after he'd become a letterer at the school. But it was Johnston and uh, Eric Gill who then became uh, the designers of the lettering for the London Underground, which is still very much in use. And it was Gill who produced out of that the Gill Sands type, which is probably one of the most widely used types worldwide. Those graphics which Gill and Johnson produced for the London, uh, for the London Underground have had many they had a, a rich progeny, and um, one of them, of course, was the map which Harry Beck produced in 1931, for which I am told he was paid 10 guineas, 
map which we still all use. And uh, it was also emulated uh, by the Vignellis in the New York subway system map uh, about 20 years ago. At the Central School, Lethabis dealing with the LCC were not always easy. And he jibbed at the bureaucracy which he had to satisfy. He moved sideways to the Royal College of Art in 1901 as one of the four professors in charge of design. It brought a leaf and it was his last official position. As long as he was actively in practice, he laid off scholarship. A wonderful monograph on Hagia Sophia was his one scholarly publication before 1900. But once he had withdrawn from practice, there was a stream of publications on medieval art, on the history of London, on Westminster, on Westminster Abbey, of which he would become surveyor to the public in 1903, on the Greek antiquities, oddly enough, not a medieval subject, on the Greek antiquities in the British Museum. And he also edited his popular handbooks on handicrafts, which are still, some of which are still in print. And he contributed generously to, the period, to periodicals, perhaps more to the NIBA journal than to, to any other. For all his historical scholarship, he always considered himself a modern. He had no truck with any kind of what is called traditionalism. But he was not interested in modernism as a style. Modernism conceived as a style, he wrote, is only inverted archaeology. It will only be real when it is unconscious. Modern were, of course, the students' exercises at the Royal College of Art. Effectively, the original of the new, now university practice, practice of uh, elementary design. The course of the elementary design course, which from the Royal College moved to the Bauhaus and then moved all over the world was really devised by Lethaby in those years, at the, his years at the college. Um, it involved the use and distribution of patterns. It involved exercises which he had devised and which he called games, making constructions from bundles of rods, very much what the Bauhaus was going, was going to teach in the four course. This is an interesting example of Lethaby's influence. This is a, a, an exercise done in Eaton's class in 1922 by a Russian student which has been reconstructed from photographs for the Bauhaus Museum in Berlin. Lethaby has a long reach. But at the time when he was doing this, it was not at all what the rather stuffy Board of Education on which the college depended, thought appropriate, and Lethaby was eased out in, into early retirement at the end of the war. He was 60. The students gave him a bicycle as a parting present. Now, the odd thing is about the three refusers of the medal is that the, although they were very keen, as Ruskin particularly was, very keen on academic recognition, they shrank from both state and professional distinction. Lethaby loved, lived long enough and was sharp enough to see that in the 20th century, 20th century conditions, the figure like Norman Shaw, all-round artist architect, was no longer plausible. Perhaps not even desirable. Addressing an RIBA conference on architectural education shortly before he retired from the Royal College, he even specified different special skills for which a future architect would have to be trained. And in 1922, 10 years before the Mars Group was founded, he produced the charter of a group which never actually took, took form, which he called Modern Architecture Constructive Group, 
and its leading notion was to be that architecture is a developing structural art satisfying the special requirements of the time by experiment. Now remember, this is written in 1922. And he prefaced this assertion by deploring the absence of theory and the consequent anarchy of practice. Now, nearly a century has passed since the absence of theory deplored has turned into a surfeit, I would say almost a glut. While the public image of practice has become dominated by the figure of the architect whose individual achievements figure in the media much as do other fashion statements. While they are all too often the product of speculative ambitions grafted onto, onto a financial core. Urbanism has produced as Balkan growing literature's architecture, in spite of which one cites our city's language. It would seem that our elders and betters, who engaged in fighting for architecture as an art against architecture as a profession, were simply fighting the wrong battle. In spite of his churlishness, it was Lethaby who realized it clearly and apostrophized us nearly a century ago. This institute has to see to it that in matters of public building policy, the advice of architects is not only sought, but taken. Now, this is 1917. How that was to be brought about, Lethaby could not, would not say though he did realize, and we know it all too well, that it depends much as much on the makers of public policy as it does on the institute and the profession. The critical role in the making of the powers that be, aware of architecture and its importance, is distinguished such architecture as have played a critical role in recent building. Now, this is a, a this is perhaps the most important public role that the Institute has. And therefore, the distinguishing of architects, as we have done today, is actually a very important impact it makes on the public realm. So I cite three recent recipients of the gold medal. The Hepworth Museum in Wakefield by Sir David Chipperfield. the school, Montessori School in Rome by Hermann Herzberger, and St. Columbus Museum in uh, Cologne by Peter Zomtor. All three have contributed in very different ways to the built environment, but also through both building and writing to the critical discourse of architecture. But as throughout its history, the Royal Institute has distinguished workers outside the profession, notably the painters and sculptors whom I have mentioned. It has also honored historians and critics. Recently, Sir Nicholas Pesner, Sir John Samuelson, Colin Rowe, and even myself. Moreover, in a gesture which mediates between these parties, our system institution, the Royal Academy, which Norman Shaw had exalted as a champion of the architecture, as, as an art, of the, and perhaps even more of the architect as an artist. Last month raised a critical discourse by an exhibition in which eight architects have been asked to mold and energize some of its exhibition halls. Go and see it for yourselves. But as a foretaste, I show you one of the Dublin practice Grafton architects. The inevitable limitations of the show are also part of, I suppose, in a way, part of its strength. But it is that it presents architecture primarily as a visual experience. Even though some of the exhibitors have devised ways to involve the visitors' other senses, touch, sound, and smell, Good as it is to be minded of the range of sensations which buildings inevitably buffet, the dimensions which still escape the exercise is the essential political one. It is a dimension which Letterby understood very well. In 
it's a dimension of which we need to be constantly reminded. For our experience of building is always political. Every building adds or diminishes the common good. That is why another gold medalist, the late Aldo van Eyck, was right to remind us that if you're not a bit of a boy scout, there's no point in going into architecture. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.